Okay, we're back here with another tanking class, uh, the Vanguard Power Tech tanking class. We're using the Shield Specialist and Shield Tech. It's quite an ambitious thing to try and cover a tanking class because there's so much to cover. Um, so this is going to probably be more on the longer side of a video. Use the chapters below to jump to the sections that might be useful and uh, for references. First, we're just quickly going to go through the main rotation class abilities. On the Vanguard side, it's Hammer Shot, Iron Pulse, Iron Storm, High Impact Bolt, Shock Strike, and Energy Blast. Those are the main ones. And then for our AoE, we're going to do Artillery, Blitz, Flak Shell, and Explosive Surge. On the Power Tech side, it's going to be Rapid Shot, Flame Burst, Firestorm, Rail Shot, Rocket Punch, Heat Blast. And then for AoE, Deadly Onslaught, Shadow Slug, a Flame Sweep. If you see a 3, it means the damage that you do with that ability is multiplied by three and that's the threat that you generate the only exception is energy blast and heat blast uh, blast um the little airplane icon means it's an actual range attack more than 10 meters we have a lot of 10 meter attacks which means we are considered to be a range uh, tanking class and this really does play a role in it the double plus sign means it's a defensive uh, meaning that if we do this attack, it plays a role in how our defensive stance is and uh, avoiding damage. Um, the triangle is AoE, conal or AoE attacks, and we'll look into that. The defensive and utility abilities on the Vanguard side is Adrenaline Rush, Shield Adrenal. We always want a Shield Adrenal, always, always. It makes a huge difference for us as a tank. Reactive Shield, Infuse, Culter Packs, Battle Focus, Riot Gas, Hold the Line, Harpoon. On the Power Tech side, it's Culter Overload, Shield Adrenal, of course, same thing. Always, always have a Shield Adrenal. Energy Shield, Energy Yield, Explosive Fuel, Oil Slick, Hydraulic Overrides, Grapple. Our Ability Tree, I generally recommend this layout. Uh, you can see there's a lot of exceptions that you might want to consider. Uh, line 39 is a really unique situation and we'll explore that. Line 27 is really situational and can really play a big role. Line 23, I generally recommend just the middle one. Um, and we'll look at why, even though I highlighted this other option, why it's not actually really that beneficial. Okay, our tacticals and implants. Uh, for the tactical, thermal screen is about our default uh, tactical. Um, what it does is it allows our power screens to go up to six stacks. Since power screens actually is a defensive uh, stance that we increase, it adds a very, very small extra defensive for us. Life Warden is the really other big one that is really, really powerful in certain situations. But that 10-minute cooldown can really hurt if we want to do multiple pulls. Wildfire... I wouldn't even consider it in most places because it is just such a complicated one to use. You have to put your riot gas out and then use iron storm with enemies in the riot gas to cleave for a 20% more damage. It really is a lot of effort for not much. Um, the damage reduction is great, but it's for uh, if we had that many enemies around us, our defensive chance is a better thing, and we have a lot of defensive chance options already, especially with riot gas. Uh, on the implant side, I love Super Commando package. When we activate um, our infused Colter packs, we get a 1.6 million damage absorbed for three seconds. That means that if we time it right. We really can just stand there and just eat about any damage out there, almost any damage. Squad leader package is more like uh, uh, teammates helping them out whenever we activate that reactive shield of ours. It applies a weaker shield for nearby allies for three seconds. This is whenever we take damage. So think about it. If we have constant damage going out, we keep reapplying these shields. They're small shields, but they keep reducing the damage. Uh, think about the first boss in Eternity Vault. Uh, when that AoEs go out, you can swing into the group, activate your active shield, and every time you get a damage, you're putting the shield on your uh, friends nearby. Um, if we need more DPS, Shock Trooper is a good alternative. Um, I would replace Squad Leader um, and get that extra damage from a shock trooper okay our opening sequence is a really interesting one um we don't have the highest dps as a tank and that really can be a problem for us especially on an opener 
Um, what we do want to know about the harpoon and grapple is it almost works like a soft taunt. So we, if we can, we want to start with a harpoon, uh, do our impact charge, rising phoenix, our gap closer. Our biggest DPS one is going to be uh, iron storm, then shock strike for um, uh, setting it up, neuro jolt. This is our taunt with the neuro jolt dart. Then Energy Blast or Disrupt the Rifle, depending on what we picked on line 39. And then Impact Bolt. And what we want to know here is that Energy Blast, um, Heat Blast, these abilities are instant casts. So they don't affect our global cooldown. So if we think about our Neuro Jolt, which we'll explore a little bit more, it lasts for six seconds for a guaranteed aggro. So if we time it with four global cooldowns, which energy blast doesn't count, so the high impact bolt, a filler, 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 so four abilities, and then do an AOE taunt, we will have the guaranteed taunt um, aggro from the single target taunt, and then another six seconds here. So this whole time, um, we can look at it, we can guarantee aggro on the boss, and we can give our DPS time to build up some damage, and then do our final AOE taunt to ensure that we have the boss. Uh, this is a really useful technique, and we're going to explore some of this um, opening strategies that we can use. I'm calling this a filler. Um, this could be a defensive ability at this point, especially in the early start of the fight. We haven't had a lot of time to get our uh, abilities activated to build up our defenses. Um, so it might be a good idea to have a defensive ability at this point, depending on the boss. The power tech, uh, shield tech is gonna be grapple, rising phoenix, firestorm, rocket punch, neural dart, heat blast or payday, depending on what we picked, rail shot, and then three fillers and a sonic missile. Our priority sequence is really interesting as well because energy blast, since it plays such a key role on our defensives, plays takes a high priority because of that high impact bolt is one of our biggest single target hits but it's also an aoe hit at the same time with some of the other effects that it has iron storm is our next biggest hit and then shock strike iron pulse hammer shot but we cannot just be slamming on iron pulse or flame burst on the uh, imperial side we do want to mix in hammer shot because hammer shot has that ability the defensive boost that it gives us as well so we need to balance all of these and you'll notice that you, you dance around with all of these abilities if you did the disruptor rifle and payday and you're trying to get the benefits from that the timing of energy blast is actually going to be quite an uh, or disruptor rifle instead is going to be really important okay we need to know a little bit about the damage path if we are going to be a tank. So the way that damage works when we're receiving damage is the incoming damage has an accuracy associated with it. Our defense chance gets evaluated. If the accuracy beats our defense chance, then we receive that damage and it goes down the damage path. If our defense chance beats the accuracy, we avoid the damage completely. Then when it gets to the next part is that our shield chance gets evaluated. If our shield chance activates, then the damage gets reduced by the shield absorption percentage. And then it goes to the next step, which is damage reduction. So we have three things, defense chance, shield chance with shield absorption, and then damage reduction. As a Vanguard power tech tank, we specialize in the shield of our capabilities and we can look at that a little bit more as we go further in but we have a unique situation where we also have a defense chance we can raise our defense chance to unique situations depending on the attack so that can play a role we have a really good damage reduction capability as well so we are more of an all-round thing but we really rely quite well on our shield chance so planning our defensives can actually be really important depending on which kind of damage we receive. The exceptions to this damage path is what's called, uh, considered internal or elemental damage. Um, we're going to skip the defense chance part, but what we need to know about it is that our shield never gets evaluated with internal and elemental damage. Only our damage reduction, but it's a different damage reduction. It is not the same damage reduction as all of the other attacks. There's a different internal and elemental damage reduction. 
the defense chance with internal and elemental damage generally doesn't actually play a role at all. But it is there. Um, it's just that internal and elemental damage, I suspect, has an incredibly high accuracy. There are certain attacks, the defensives, that can be used that raises your defense chance incredibly high. And in those situations, you can see the avoidance of elemental and internal damage. So I suspect that internal and elemental damage do get evaluated for defense chance just with an incredibly high accuracy. So generally, we ignore the defense chance feature of internal and elemental damage. We just look at damage reduction as in a method of how to avoid it. Forge tech damage. Uh, works the same as weapon and kinetic damage, so it follows the same path. Damage types. What we need to know a little bit about damage types. We don't need to know a lot, but as um, a tank that really specializes in tech, we really have certain situations where we can defend against um, range attacks or tech attacks, we might not be able to specifically avoid certain force attacks and we need to understand that at certain times and it's not important to know exactly what is a force attack and what is a tech attack for us we need to understand that there are different types of attacks so we can look at the the tools that we have to be able to evaluate that but what we might have is an aoe attack that applies direct damage attacks so if we have something that mitigates direct damage attacks it would work for us in this situation. If you have something that mitigates AoE damage, it would work for us in this situation. We could even have an AoE that does AoE that does direct damage attacks, meaning that we have an area that applies an AoE attack, that that AoE attack, when it gets uh, multiple people are in it, gets direct damage attacks. We could even have a conal AoE attack that is considered a melee attack that does direct damage attacks. Think of these as tags that are assigned to uh, damages. And if we have anything that mitigates any of these tags, it might apply and reduce that damage. We could even have a damage over time ability that is in an AOE area that, that then spreads a damage over time that's in an AOE area that does internal damage. This can get really tricky depending on the mechanics and we just sometimes have to really learn the fight to understand what works and what doesn't work. This can be time consuming for more complicated fights and that's the fun of the game. There's something to learn. Okay, but what we can never have, for example, is a direct attack that does internal or elemental damage. There are some attacks that are mutually exclusive and what they mean. Next, we need to understand the threat mechanism. So for most tank damages, our damage is multiplied by three, and that's the threat. We have a few key abilities that have other modifiers, like four times. In this case, we have one that does 3.75, and that's multiplied by threat. Single target taunts, what they do is they take the highest threat in the threat table for the enemy that we taunt. They take that threat level and they multiply it by 1.1, and that's the new target threat level. So the way that it achieves that is subtracting our current threat level from that new target and adding the new the difference to our threat table. And that's how we get our new threat. So if we start a fight and there's very little threat that's on the threat table for that enemy, and we taunt really early, there's very little that we're doing really. We're only multiplying a small percentage. So taunts early in the fight or the very, very start of the fight are very ineffective. What they do for us is they give us a hold of aggro for six seconds. That's the second thing that a, ta a taunt will do. It guarantees a hold for aggro for six seconds, regardless of what the threat level is. AOE taunts work the same, they just work for every enemy in, the, um, in that AOE area. So for example, the way that we can think of it is that any player has multiple buckets for each of the enemies in the arena. And as we do damage or as we generate threat, we put more of that threat into our bucket. 
Now, the combat logs don't reflect this individuality of these buckets. They just sum all of the buckets together, and so that sometimes can be quite deceptive. We could, in fact, have a scenario where there's a threat table where the DPS is, say, at 500,000 total threat, another DPS at 400, the tank is at 8,000, and the healer is at 6,000. But for another enemy, the tank might be at 700,000, 60,000 for the DPS there, depending on what damage they did. Now, in this case, we can now look at a scenario where if the tank was to taunt this green enemy, the 500,000 would be multiplied by 1.1, which will now be 550,000. The tank's 8,000 would be subtracted, and the tank would then get the remainder as the new threat level. Let's look at it as a, tank, as a table for timelines. So let's say the tank starts out and is at 100,000 threat at 5 seconds into the fight. The DPS is at 100,000 DPS, which is equivalent to the threat that they generate. So at this point, they are equal. If the tank taunts at 5 seconds, post 10, a 5 second taunt immediately right after, the tank would be 10% up at 110%. The tank would now be at 22,000 threat per second, and the DPS is still at the same number. If the tank doesn't do any damage at this point, when we get to 10 seconds in, the tank would still be at 110,000, but by this time the DPS is at 200,000. But because of that 6 second taunt uh, aggro, we would still have aggro. But if we weren't not able to do anything else after this, and we were getting to 12 seconds into the fight, suddenly the, t the enemy would switch to the DPS because they would have the highest threat. Let's say we taunt again at 10 uh, seconds in, and now the highest threat is the, uh, the DPS. We multiply that by 10%, and we get that 220,000, and now we're back on top. If at 15 seconds we haven't done anything yet, we would still be at 220,000, and the, the DPS would be at 300,000. We can quickly see that at 20 seconds we lose the boss again. So it's so important for a tank to keep doing damage. We are not just only adding our own threat generation, we're adding uh, the total threat that is in the pool uh, for the highest DPS or the highest tanking, and we're adding on top of that. Now, we need to talk a little bit about threat awareness. Uh, tanks and DPS share their threat value by doing damage, by taunting, and uh, the, this is the mechanic by which they establish their threat. Healers don't. Healers generate an AOE threat awareness, meaning as soon as they heal, they generate threat for anything in the in the arena. And here we have a, a look of uh, combat. This was a watchdog um, hard mode. And you can see the blue line is the tank and the green line is the healer. And the healer is really, really, really low. But the threat awareness is within the arena, which means that if any new enemy enters, what they will see is this green line threat. They won't see the tank's threat. So the way that you establish threat is by doing some damage or, or taunting that enemy. You can also look at the beginning of the fight. The DPS is ahead. And there was a double uh, stacking taunt that we'll talk about later as a mechanic to get up above. But there's repeated taunts at the beginning of the fight to maintain that above the DPS. And as the fight progresses a little bit further on, you can see a taunt, a taunt, another taunt, and you just keep building up as you go along. There's always a taper down, even if you get really high, because your DPS that's establishing your threat is always going to be lower than what you potentially could achieve with just a taunt uh, series. We need to look a little bit at combat logs. Uh, it's a really highly recommended strategy to use uh, some star, uh, some combat parsing um, tools just to understand certain fights. It doesn't mean it's essential. It just means it makes it a little bit easier to understand what's going on in a fight. And what you would do is you would go to your game preferences. You would go to the settings, combat logging, and enable combat logging. And what it will do is anytime you fight uh, an enemy or in the game, it'll generate the text file with the combat logs that will be in your My Documents folder 
Star Wars The Old Republic Combat Logs. You want to regularly go in here if you do enable this and delete the old files. Um, they will just keep stacking up and of course it's an obvious thing nobody wants to go ahead and automatically delete old files off of your system so the better way to do it is for you to just go in there on a regular basis and delete it don't toggle this on and off it actually can cause some more problems if you turn it on selectively just keep it on and regularly clear it out these fights for a whole evening might be 30 megabytes a log file but consider that over many nights of 30 megabyte uh, files for a night, this could actually get quite sizable. Next, we want a tool that can help us out. And my suggestion is to start with a start, uh, star posh. Um, if you Google star posh, you will see the first site is that um, this site that will, where you can download the app, you would download it. And all you need to do is click the posh parsing button at the top, right? And then as a tank, you can click on interface and click on raid threat and it'll have a little uh, floating uh, window that you can put somewhere on your game uh, that you can see what's going on. You would have to be in full screen windowed mode to get it. If you were just in full screen mode, you wouldn't be able to see that. If you have a dual monitor, then you can have it on the side. Okay, let's look at starting the fight. Starting the fight, and this is going to especially be important with a Vanguard um, and a power tech tank you don't have the highest dps numbers when it comes to tanking um, and you would have to take certain considerations in this so this is going to be a little bit more sensitive for you as a vanguard tank especially in your opener because certain abilities you still need to unlock as you get there so the general way of starting tanking is to count the group in it would be the general thing is three two one and the fight starting on one dps no when they hear one they start shooting now some dps will start precasting at two or three and what it what they will establish that it is based on how you count so counting really fast three two one is not a good strategy you generally want to do three two one something along those lines where it's clear about the timing between the gaps between your three two and one now for you as a tank you might start the fight at two and the reason why you might start the fight at two is that you might need that time to set up the boss to get aggro on the boss and make sure that you've got some abilities in that generated some threat um, and that could be really really handy if you do it consistently, the DPS might just learn that, oh, we start the fight on two. If you really want them to start the fight on one, it's good to communicate that to the group. And this, of course, all applies if you're only in voice communication. If you're just are not in voice communication, then you just go ahead and start the fight when you're ready. But generally, you want to train your group and communicate to them, okay, this is what's going to happen. Um, I need a moment to settle the boss down, so I'm going to start the fight at two, but if you guys can really start at one and uh, be consistent with how you do that. Okay, keybinds. Keybinds are so, so handy as a tank. Um, what you would do, um, one of the biggest thing is the focus target feature. If you go into preferences and controls um, in the game, you go to enable focus target. The next thing you want to do is go to the keybind section, go to targeting, and the about the third or fourth ability down is set focus target, swap focus target. The default is Alt F, but it, you might want to assign it to something that's quite handy. And one main scenario that's really good is that if you are with two tanks, and say you're the second tank on boss B, but on a regular basis, you guys are going to swap, the tanks are going to swap the bosses. That's a common thing that happens in a lot of fights. What you can do is on the boss A tank, uh, on that boss, you can focus target that boss. You would target boss B. And when you start the fight, all you have to do is to swap uh, the bosses, is do another Alt F, and it will swap the, alt, the focus target with your target and so your focus target becomes the target and your target becomes the focus target one key will swap them in your rotation and then all you have to do is do your taunt your single target taunt on that boss 
and the swap is automatic. So just with a single keybind, you can alternate between the bosses. Um, that is a really, really handy way to control, especially when there's a lot of other enemies around and you need to find that one specific enemy. Another way to do it is that's really handy is to go a little bit further on in the targeting section and say acquire focus targets target. So what you could do in this situation is if you have a really top end DPS in the group that is always pulling aggro off of you, you can focus target that top end DPS. You can then press this key. In my case, I use the number five key. And you'll always acquire the focus target's target, meaning the boss that they're fighting. And you know by default that's the one that's probably going to have the most damage. So you, if you're trying to find out who that DPS is on, you can just press that number five key and you'll immediately target that boss and you can taunt them. Another option is to, if you need to interrupt an enemy that's different than the enemy that you're focused on. The next thing you can do is focus target modifier. So what happens is if I set the focus target as say boss A again, but I'm going to be on boss B, then I can hold in the focus target modifier key and my cursor will turn purple. Any ability that I click at that point will go to boss A, not boss B. This is a really handy way for a single tank to deal with two bosses simultaneously where they can alternate what abilities they activate by just holding down the focus target modifier key. So it's a great thing to practice and we can demonstrate that later on. The push-pull method. This is so important. Most people know about the pull method. You run away from an enemy, a melee enemy, and they follow you. Even with a range enemy, if you're far enough away, they will follow you. Um, you can line of sight a range enemy around a box, and they'll follow you. That's how you can get a group all together. That's great. The most important one that most people skip is the push method. And for melee People will use, if they need to get a melee boss into place, they'll pull most likely. But the push method is that there is some sort of bubble around every enemy where it's sort of like, this is my personal bubble. And if you encroach on that bubble, that enemy will take a step back. It means you can steer the boss. You can go to the one side and they'll go to the opposite side and they'll move away in that direction. You can even do this with range enemies. And there's many enemies that seem to be stationary and static that you can do with this with. There's a few exceptions, but most enemies you can do this with. Champions. So the way to identify a champion is that on their um, avatar health bar, you'll see this uh, gold silver lining um, icon, and that's a champion. What you want to look for is what buffs they have, is that if they have a boss immunity buff, they'll be immune to in capacitating effects like stuns or slowing them down and that's going to help you understand what other options you will take in the tree for example do you take a stun if you have a champion that is going to be around the fight for a lot you and they don't have this buff you might want to take a stun because you can interrupt them that way and there's certain fights where you really want to stun even if it's not a champion because there's certain mechanics related to the stun the other one is the unshakable cast and channel and abilities cannot be interrupted. This is really, really huge for a uh, Vanguard power tech tank. We have one of the fastest um, interrupts, meaning that we can get our interrupt cooldown down to 10 seconds. We also have a gap closer that works like an interrupt uh, for some attacks. So we really have, with our gap closer and our interrupt, have about an interrupt of roughly around every five to six seconds that we can pull off and so we really want to be aware of this unshakable buff because it really can be a key feature if the enemy doesn't have this we can do a lot to avoid incoming damage now to practice my favorite place to practice my tanking is hammer station and the way that i do it is i do it solo and we're going to look at that a little bit later but this is a great place to go in there with your companion in master mode. Uh, try it out in veteran mode first, but the next step is, is definitely go to master mode and see how much you can last. The boss will enrage at eight, eight minutes into the fight. 
and will really start hammering down about 300% damage increase and you can really practice and see if you can stay alive and planning your attacks and your defensives. Great place to practice. You can also practice pushing and pulling in this fight, uh, messing around with the boss, seeing where you can do. Um, another one is Nathema, where Gemini 16 is on the platform. Great place to practice on a line of sighting some of the attacks. Let's get into the game and start looking at some of the features. Here in the game, let's quickly look at the armor configuration setup. Uh, my suggestion is get to about 6,000 shield and the re remainder goes into absorb. I wouldn't go much beyond 6,700 um, because the shield chance uh, diminishing returns at that number becomes quite drastic. Uh, we will look at how we increase our shield chance. For me, getting my absorb up to 3,500 gives me a percentage of about 40.76 and the remainder uh, defense will automatically be set up. You want to achieve this by using augments as well. Even if it's not high level augments, augments in your gear really makes a difference in getting those numbers up there. Let's go to through the ability tree. Ion Cell is our base uh, ability that converts us into a tank. It increases our uh, threat generation by 200%, um, our shield chance by 15%, and our damage reduction by 5%, as well as our armor rating increase by 61.5%. Um, it also reduces the amount of damage we do by 10%, since we're supposed to be doing uh, less damage. Uh, the additional thing is that we also have an Iron Cell as an activated ability. So when Iron Cell has a 15% chance to do damage, and whenever it does damage, it will also put basically a, a, a dot of energy damage over 9 seconds on. And we can see that when we activate, say, Hammer Shock, they, it triggered, and we'll t talk about how Shock doesn't combine to that, but that's that dot over 9 seconds. Then Iron Overload dealing damage with Shock Strike triggers Iron Cell, so now when we do Shock Strike, we don't have that 15% chance, we have 100% chance, and that will also put that dot on. It also, uh, dealing damage with High Impact Bolt, uh, triggers Iron Cell as well, so we need now have two abilities that will trigger Iron Cell. Um, and the target, and we'll place the iron cell up to seven additional enemies uh, within five meters. So we do shock strike, and then our high impact bolt, and then now high impact bolt is an AOE with it, with any target within five meters of our, our main target. They won't affect sleeping targets, and so it also generates a high amount of threat. So great threat generation with that great AOE option. Um, so that built, is built into our uh, standard setup. Power Screen. Power Screen is a, an ability that um, each stack increases our shield uh, absorption by 1% for 20 seconds. It stacks up to three times, but with the thermal screen, it stacks up to six times. So um, we can get up to six stacks of that 6% uh, shield absorption. This effect cannot occur more than once every 1.5 seconds. We should see here that this is triggered by an attack um, while when you do the, any attack. And so, for example, I can start hitting here. There's one stack. And then 1.5 seconds later, you see that dot automatically builds up. And automatically, the, this number is built, built up. The energy blast is affected by these power screens. We need at least three to activate energy blast. Um, if we activate Energy Blast and we build up stacks again, the cooldown of Energy Blast comes off. So as we build up stacks, we can see that Energy Blast's uh, cooldown comes down. Um, it's generally at 13.6 seconds, but with this mechanic, it comes down to about 9 uh, seconds or so. Um, if you actually are in a fight, especially with uh, ads around, uh, your dot spread with the iron cell will cause this to just become available standard based on every 9 second rotation. Okay, pulse engine. Direct damage attacks have a 75% chance to trigger pulse engine, which finishes the cooldown of iron wave or iron storm. That happens can only happen every 15 seconds. It also reduces the amount of energy that iron wave does or iron storm. 
So let's look at Iron Storm, what it does. Um, it is a conal attack, so when we do that, it does a set of damage. It also applies a debuff called Impaired. And Impaired uh, reduces the force and tech damage that the target does by 5%. So that's a damage reduction effectively by doing damage with this conal. And uh, we'll look later, uh, we'll jump over to some of the other things here. Let's quickly look at Point Man at this stage. Dealing damage with Iron Storm grants a stack of Point Man, and each enemy you hit increases the damage of your tech and elemental attacks by 3% per stack. Last for 10 seconds and stacks up to 8 times. So think about it, we get Iron Storm every 15 seconds, and now we can get these stacks. Here they are, we have one enemy, one stack. Um... And if there was a multiple enemies, we would do multiple things. We would reduce the force and tech damage that they do by 5%, as well as build up stacks of uh, point. And that increases all of our additional in uh, damage that we do. We'll look and see how... Um, let's quickly just tie this in together. We saw that direct damage attacks have a 75% chance to trigger Pulse Engine, which finishes the cooldown of Iron Wave. So that is an example of that is that if I do a conal and do say shock strike, you see how it resets iron storm and then I can do it again. Okay, now I have two stacks of point man. The problem with this is that on an opener, if we were to do this, we would generally trigger this point man, um, this uh, reset. The So if you look at that, as we pulse it, that we triggered already. And so we can't do it generally on an opener if we use our gap closer. So just be aware of that if you really are wanting to exploit this double stacking on a single target. You do not want to use your gap closer, but your gap closer is such a great threat generation that we don't necessarily want to give that up. Okay, the other option on line 23, let's cover that right now, is Pulse Cannon. So Pulse Cannon uh, turns our uh, Iron Storm into a pulse cannon and this is what it looks like we can turn it and it cost for you know 2.8 um, seconds 2.9 seconds about if we look at the description of pulse cannon it does uh, up to 18,000 damage uh, whereas iron storm does about 12,000 damage but keep in mind the cast time of uh, Pulse Cannon is 2.8 seconds, where Iron Storm is on a global cooldown since it's a quick cast. So Iron Storm actually does more DPS because it's so much quicker. The purpose of Pulse Cannon is that we still have that, um, that effect where we can apply a debuff to the targets that reduces their force and tech damage by 5% for 45 seconds. So the reason why you would take Pulse Cannon is not for the DPS. It is the, the bad option for DPS. But if you need to spread that debuff to multiple targets around you, that's when it it's, it's a viable option. The alternative is just to take Point Man and step back and do Iron Storm, right? Like, so I can do Point... Uh, step back and get that whole group with the tunnel with Iron Storm. I would have the same effect okay so generally i wouldn't recommend pulse cannon because the other problem that it has is that all of that damage has to be done over 2.8 seconds but it has to be done while you stay static so you can't move as soon as you move you break that effect and that's not a great option so i prefer point man as an option here Let's go to Static Shield. Increases the critical chance of Shock Strike and Explosive Surge by 10%. In addition, shielding or defending an attack has a 50% chance to finish the cooldown of Shock Strike. This effect cannot occur more than 7.5 uh, seconds. It just puts a Shock Strike on a 7.5 second cooldown. It generally happens all the time. We have a damage increase as well. Um, great uh, little buff there. Shield Cycler. Increases the shield chance by 2%. In addition, shielding or defending an attack generates one energy cell. This effect cannot occur uh, more than once every 1.5 seconds, increasing the damage reduction by 2%, armor rating by 15%, and damage dealt by ion cell by 10%. So 
So this is going to happen all the time. Um, keep in mind, shielding an attack is whenever we shield it, we have a very high shield chance. Defending an attack is whenever defense chance stops an attack. So this occurs quite often, or, you know, it's a regular thing. It's a little bit difficult to demonstrate with a dummy because we have to see incoming damage. But when we do the example, pay attention to this buff going off on the buff tray, you'll see it take off quite often. Soldier's Grit. Adrenaline Rush now heals you for 2% of your total health every second, while above 35% of your maximum health. Additionally, Battle Focus increases defense chance by 35% while active. So, let's cover Adrenaline Rush. Adrenaline Rush is this ability that um, it applies fire up for us for, on, for 60 seconds, and we're going to activate it and see that. And when fired up is triggered when our health drops below 35%. When it drops below 35%, we get a lot of heals to bring us up to 35%. But now with Soldier's Grit, it'll go beyond 35%. So a great idea is that if we plan to use this uh, ability on when we low on health, is to pair it when it triggers with some defensive. That'll make the heals just so much more effective. And it won't just keep us at 35%, it can push us way beyond 35%. So that's a uh, something just to take note of if you plan to use the adrenaline and rush pair it with some defensive that's really good to get you up there okay shield enhancers shock strike high impact bolt grants shield enhancers when activated increasing your shield chance by one percent for 15 seconds stacks up to three times so we can use that there's shield enhancers high impact bolt will add another two with just normal attacks we can see our shock strike comes available and we can keep these shield enhancers available you know alive all the time I increase shield absorption by four percent additional energy blast disruptor rifle increases shield absorption by an additional five percent so this is energized absorbers um so we're going to tie this up and we're going to look at uh, line 35 let's look at what energy blast does um it does uh, X amount of elemental damage, and if there's three targets within five meters, it will also do that elemental damage to them. So Energy Blast is kind of like an AoE attack by itself. Um, in addition to that, it restores some energy cells, but it also increases our shield absorption by 25% for six seconds. But now, with Energized Absorbers, we add 5% on top of that. So instead of a shield absorption going up by 25%, that's 30%. Uh, this ability is, of course, only usable when we have three power screens and generates 25 additional threat. Uh, that threat is static. It gets the threat multiplier to about 3.75. Okay, so let's look at that absorption real quick since we on energy blast. So uh, we saw earlier that the power screens will give us a 1% shield absorption. Um, with the thermal screen, we can get up to six. So now we're at six and we can see our shield absorption is at 46.7. If we now enable energy blast, we should get a 30% rise, but we'll lose three power screens as well. So we lost and there we gained the stack again. So we're now at 75, back at 76%. And because of energy blast coming off of cooldown every nine seconds and this lasting six seconds, this is possible to have this available every 66% 60, uh, of the time. So this is a very powerful ability that we want to keep in our rotation whenever it comes off cooldown. Something else about energy blast is it's an instant cast. If I activate an ability, take note that the global cooldown screen never overlays on the energy blast. I can activate Energy Blast any time in real time in between the activating another ability. For example, like this. And it went off in between that. Okay, so that's Energy Blast. With Energy Blast, um, we can look at Frontline Solider. Um, firing Energy Blast grants you a stack of Frontline Solider. This increases your shield chance by 1% per stack. In addition, Iron Pulse and Explosive Surge also generates a stack of frontline soldier max of five stacks so this is a shield chance increase and we can we build up some stacks 
and you can see I can activate Iron Pulse and it doesn't give me that debuff, that buff. Um, and the reason why is I first have to put it on with Energy Blast. Okay, so let's look at Shield Chance. It's at 48%. If I now activate Energy Blast, it goes up by 49%. And now if I use Iron Pulse, it builds stacks. And I can get up to 5 stacks. And this is something that will just stay alive all the time. If I just use Iron Pulse every couple of seconds and use my Energy Blast as it comes off cooldown, I can keep those stacks up at all the time. In addition to this, Explosive Surge will also refresh it. So that's something to take note that Explosive Surge and Iron Pulse are cousins of each other. Iron Pulse being the single target damage at attack explosive surge being the aoe damage attack so now to look at disruptor rifle disruptive rifle is a replacement of our uh, energy blast if i select this it replaces energy blast but the description is now different it does now more elemental damage almost double the elemental damage but only to a single target um, everything else is the same that with when it comes to the shield absorption it's 25 percent but keep in mind with energy absorbers, it's another 5%, so 30%. And the threat generation is the same. In addition to all of that, it increases the shield chance by 3%. So with Frontline Solider, I have 5%. With Disruptive Rifle, I have 3%. So pretty much the same ability. I lose 2% shield absorption. Not the worst. Depending on the situation, this could be better. Frontline Soldier is definitely better for AoE targets if there's mobs and so much, uh, if I need to do some dot spreading or energy damage. Um, but Disruptive Rifle is better for single target, but it has one additional thing, and that is it reduces the cooldown of Nero Jolt by 3 seconds. So Nero Jolt is our main taunt, sits at a 15 second cooldown. If I use any Disruptor Rifle, it'll reduce that by... Um, Three seconds so making it a 12 second so if we keep in mind with our threat uh, whenever we do a taunt uh, we have aggro for six seconds guaranteed we have our aoe taunt as our sonic round so if we can now do a neuro jolt and six seconds later do sonic round and six seconds later after that do another neuro jolt we have 18 seconds where we just keep uh, forcing the target to have aggro on us and every time we taunt um, we are at a later stage in that timeline where if the dps is spiking early in the fight we can sustain that threat level and build on their dps to get above okay so let's look at that hero jolt what i could do if i was going to set this up i would do my regular opener get to neural jolt in disrupt the rifle and then i can watch this if it's at six seconds i can a we taunt and now look at the taunt coming off and as it comes off i can do another taunt okay so it's great to have that chain of taunting effect on the target we do have a light slight problem with uh, nero jolt um it that effect can only occur once about every 12 seconds so even if it doesn't trigger on it and it's a little bit difficult to display but in a fight this happens quite often so so what i'm going to do is i'm going to do a hero jolt and then a disrupt the rifle and i'm going to try and reset it um so that i can try and do neuro jolt again to simulate as if i was going to get nine seconds instead of just 12 seconds getting double disrupt the rifle keep in mind disrupt the rifle i can get down to nine seconds to now so let's look at this so this was a 12 second you can see disrupt the rifle coming down and you'll take note that i triggered it and nothing happened so one cooldown effect on neuro jolt can only happen once per neuro jolt but there's a further problem that can occur if i do neuro jolt disrupt the rifle and do it again the next set of neuro jolt might not actually get it because that 12 second effect might it will prevent the third one from triggering let's see if we can simulate that Yep, 
you see, we never got that cooldown. Okay, so that is a risk with Disruptor Rifle. If we are focusing on the taunt cooldown reduction for Neuro Jolt with Disruptor Rifle, we want to pair one Neuro Jolt to one Disruptor Rifle, which means we lose some of that timing because now instead of being on a 9 second cooldown rotation for Disruptor Rifle, we're on a 12 second. So now we have that 50% uptime for those uh, shield absorb instead of the 66%. That is fine if we are looking at changing, you know, getting Neuro Jolt on a much faster cooldown timing. And that might have to take focus. We have a lot of other defensives. If we do lose that absorb for, uh, a little bit more often than not, then it's not the worst, but this could be great in an opener. The flip side is that once we don't need this cooldown for the Neuro Jolt, we can go back to using Disruptor Rifle as much as we want to. And the advantage of that could be is that Disruptor Rifle can have sort of two faces to it. The one side where we really focus on getting the Neuro Jolt uh, cooldown. And the other side where we get uh, Shield Absorb aspect of the fight. As well as that 3% Shield Chance. Okay. So that's Disrupt the Rifle and Energy Blast. Let's jump down to line 27 and look at this real quick. Harpoon gets two charges and finishes the cooldown of Shock Strike. Um, Harpoon is a grapple, you know, a pull to us, but it generates also a lot of threat. So if you know of a fight where there's enemies that come in at range or you want to pull enemies together, the two grapples or two harpoons are a great option for that. The other effective alternative is extraction plan this allows you to get you'll only get one harpoon at this point but you can pull your friendlies as well this is great when a friendly is in a mechanics that they can't get out of and you can pull them out of that so let's that's a great option there infused colter packs uh, this is very very powerful ability and we're going to quickly discover how that becomes really powerful it's cooldown is one minute and that really changes the effect but it's in conjunction with our implant super commando package it provides us with a three second 1.6 million damage absorb so it will just for the first three seconds it will just absorb which actually plays a really big deal in it because the next thing that it does whenever we take damage an additional stacks of tactical armor is applied to you up to five times and each stack um increases your armor by 40% and your damage done by 2% for 15 seconds. So our armor rating goes up by 40% for each stack up to five times. In addition to that, you gain a stack of infused Colter Packs. Each stack will heal you for 6% of your health. Now those Colter Packs have to fall off for you to get that heal. So it's only at the end of infused Colter Pack. And for me, that gets to about 140, 145,000 heals uh, in that time frame. But that armor increase has another effect that we need to look at. Armor rating relates to um, damage reduction and is com uh, contributing to 38% to damage reduction. Well, we have two different damage reductions. We have internal and elemental. They are separately calculated from energy and kinetic. Energy and kinetic damage reduction is highly reliable on our uh, armor rating. So if, whenever we look at damage reduction, um, we need to, in, when we increase our armor rating, such as with Confused Colter Pack, we need to be aware that it will only affect one type of damage type and not the internal elemental. So let's quickly look at this. It's, it's at 47% right now. If we activate Infused, it goes up to 52%. But keep in mind, this is with just one stack of Tactical Armor. If we combine that with that 3% um, Absorb from a Super Commander package, that gives us 3 seconds where we can build up stacks. And that makes this ability really, really powerful. Uh, because it's on a 1-minute cooldown, we want to use it. It's one of our first abilities we want to use. It does something else. What I did here is I built up some power screens so we can use Energy Blast. So if we now use Energy Blast and we use the Infused Colter Pack, we'll see we get another Energy Blast. But ideally we want to wait and span this and not do Energy Blast, Infused Colter Pack, Energy Blast. Because Energy Blast's effects last for 6 seconds. 
And so what we want to do is rather span it. And so when we do an energy blast in our opener, and then, so ideally we want to have our opener do an energy blast. And if we need a defensive, of course, use infused cult pack. But don't immediately go to that energy blast that's lit up and light up. Give some other abilities a rotation and then come back to energy blast and extend that shield absorption uh, from that. Uh, let's go to line 43. Cortis's weave armor, taking damage during battle focus, reduces the cooldown of uh, infused culture packs by two seconds. In addition, taking direct damage builds a stack of Cortis's, increasing the da your damage reduction by 1%. Stacks up to three times. This effect can only occur every, once every 1.2 seconds. So battle focus here with Soldier's Grit increases our defense chance by 35%. Now we have another effect where while battle focus is on, infused cult packs is reduced by two seconds whenever we um, take damage during that time. So this is a great effect to bring that infused cult pack. So we don't want to, we want to use the infused cult pack before we use battle focus. And ideally, um, consider some of the other problems that we have faced. So now battle focus will also increase us our defense chance. Okay, defense chance. So you can see that goes up to 58%. This can be a problem. Um, if the enemies we are facing uh, don't have a high accuracy and we use battle focus, we won't actually have successful attacks that will trigger the battle uh, focus uh, reduction on infused cult attack. It's also an additional thing to consider if we combine battle focus with a riot gas. Riot gas having a 15% melee and range accuracy loss on the targets, that can have a very negative in fact, impact on the part of reducing the cooldown of infused cult attacks. So, if we want to do infuse, reduce the cooldown on infused cult packs, we want to pair battle focus with something else like um, shield adrenal. But there are many attacks that are really high damage attacks that can completely be avoided by defense chance and accuracy to reduction. So if we know of those attacks and we're aware of them, we, it's a great time to take battle focus and pair it up with riot gas and just completely avoid that incoming damage. So we need to think of the sort of duality of what we can use Battle Focus for. If we want to use it to get the infused cult packs together uh, back again, we can use Battle Focus with uh, something like a Shield Adrenal, um, or just use Battle Focus on its own um, if we're still high up on health, or if we want to avoid certain attacks that we know is we can reduce that accuracy and get the defense chance high up, we can pair Battle Focus with Riot Gas, Sometimes battle focus on its own will just be good enough. Okay, impact charge is our gap closer. It's a great threat generator and does damage and interrupts on the target. So we'll look real quick on our interrupt effects. So on line 64, we can look at frontline defense. Reduces the cooldown of riot strike by two seconds. Additionally, damage taken while stunned is 30, uh, reduced by 30%. Let's just look at the stun effect real quick. It takes our right strike down to 10 second cooldown. Our impact charge is on a 13.6 second cooldown. So if we are facing an enemy and we interrupt it, run away, we can now leap and that can be an interrupt. And a few seconds later, we can do another right strike and interrupt that. So it's great for, we really effective in doing interrupt. Um, if we can't do the back run and impact charge setup, uh, we don't have to, but just consider that there's some flexibility in how you can play this. If you don't need the right strikes two second cooldown, the other option is reflect uh, armor. And this is when into the fray is triggered, it will also deal damage to the attacker if the attacker is within 10 meters. Into the fray, um, we'll jump to that in a second. But consider Frontline's other f effect is when you're stunned, you have a damage reduction of 30%. That can be really powerful um, in certain you know, setups. So that's how our impact charge and Frontline defense can work together. Um, next, let's look at the Electro Shield. 
when you activate your reactive shield, you charge your, um, they, it's charged with electricity, zapping target attackers. Um, so this works like a mini reflect. This effect cannot occur more than once every second. So this is the effect of reactive shield. Let's quickly look at reactive shield and what its main purpose is. Reactive shield is a damage reduction of 25% for 15 seconds. If we look at our damage reduction, it's 47 and in, for internal it's 19. Reactive shield is a flat look at damage reduction going up to 72% and now for internal elemental damage at 44%. So when you know that it is an attack that is doing internal elemental attack, reactive shield is a great, great solution for that. The other option is iron wool, reduces the cooldown of tenacity by 30 seconds and the cooldown of recharge shells by 15 seconds. We generally don't have to worry about recharge shells, but tenacity being our CC breaker in some fights, having a one minute, 30 second cooldown on tenacity might line up with something very specific and that can be really handy. So that might be an option for you. We looked at Riot Strike. One thing to note, champions that have boss immunity, the slowdown effect of 70%, 70% is not gonna have any effect on them. Hold the line grants an immunity from movement and pairing effects, knockdowns and physics, and increases your movement speed by 75%. That's only during combat. This is a really handy uh, tool to have. Uh, there's quite a few fights where you're going to get knocked back or knocked off a platform and you could use something like hold the line to prevent that. The other option is cry grenade. This is your stun. Uh, one thing to take note is that there are some fights where you are uh, responsible for stunning an enemy to break some effect. Uh, this is what you would then have to give up hold the line for that stun if nobody else is going to do that. Sonic Rebounder. Sonic Rebounder protects all friendly targets in its area of impact, excluding you, granting Sonic Pre Rebounder, which reflects the next direct single target attack back at the attacker. Very powerful. It's our AoE taunt, and we can apply a shield on, on targets that reflects that damage back. The other option increases the stun duration of Cryo Grenade by one second and Hero Surge by 0.5 seconds. That could be something that is um, important, especially if you're responsible for stunning. Uh, keep in mind your stun is on a 40 second cooldown, so that's not always the greatest option. Sonic Rebounder is very, very powerful. Let's quickly look into the at Into the Fray. Into the Fray is a unique ability. It's a passive. It increases the duration of reactive shield by three seconds. In addition, suffering direct damage attacks generates two energy cells and heals you for 2.5% of your total health. This effect cannot occur more than once every three seconds. But I skipped over something there. It's in addition to suffering direct damage from area attacks. Keep in mind when we talked about damage types, we now, as if that damage types working like tags, we now have two conditions that have to be met. One, direct damage, and second one, area attack. So if there's an area attack doing direct damage, this will automatically trigger every three seconds and it'll heal you for 2.5% of your health. So there are some fights where this happens all the time and there's fight, some fights where this will never happen. So it's a passive that's there. If you know fights where it will happen, then into the fray um, reflective armor could be a nice option, um, especially if you're not gonna do any interrupts. So keep that in mind. The slows generally are not a PV is a PvP or thing, because in PvE when we fight fighting champions, there's nothing that we can really slow down there. Let's quickly look at our heals. We have the med pack, we have the drill and rush, and infused culture pack. We want to pair these uh, with some defensives. Uh, infused culture pack being its own defensive, but if we compare it with something else like another defensive, it'll make those heals just seem so much bigger. Our AOE attacks. Is artillery blitz, black shell, and explosive surge. The first two have a, a stun effect on soft enemies. We also have a shoulder cannon. What's nice about the shoulder cannon is if we stunned, we can still activate it. So that's a great option there. Um, we also have neuro surge, which is a, a AOE stun um, for about 2.5 seconds. This can work as a, a interrupt if we know that there's a group 
activating some ability and we need to buy ourselves time, we can use the Neuro Surge if they can be stunned and have that effect. Guard is a great uh, ability. It reduces the damage that the player that is uh, guarded by 5% and that player will do 25% less threat. It's not necessarily very effective on a healer. Keep in mind healers do very little threat. It's just the threat awareness is an AoE. So we don't reduce the th awareness part. We're just going to reduce their threat that's all very already very low. But if we want to reduce the incoming damage that the healers are taking, that is a great t time to guard them. Um, if it's another player that needs to reduce, we need to reduce their damage, we can apply the guard to them. Um, the other effect of it is to reduce their threat. So think of it as two potential things that we might have to consider. If threat is a problem, then we guard that person. If um, damage incoming to a specific target is going to be hefty then we guard them and consider that you might want to swap the guard throughout the fight um, maybe guard somebody initially at the start of the fight and then switch that guarding to somebody else that we might have to reduce the incoming damage to them let's have a quick look at start parse and see how we can use that tool to analyze our fights and determine what we can do to avoid incoming damage so here is a hard mode Kephas fight. And if I go to the damage taken, I select the abilities. I can get a real good understanding of where the damage is that I'm getting as uh, the sources of that. So for example, I can sort by uh, the damage taken and I can see Warlord Kephas at 23 hits of an average of 35,000 damage. And look at my defense chance and i have up on the screen if i look at the game real quick we can see my defense chance is about 23 percent so what i did here um if we go back and look at star posh um i had a defense chance much higher than that so either i was using riot gas or um, battle focus to get my defense chance up look at how low my shield chance is so something related to this attack really doesn't care about the shield so much. Um, so my shield chance was much lower. Look again at the arcing slash. Okay, defense chance didn't matter much, but that's a 15% defense chance. But look at my shield chance at 55%. Okay, the only thing we won't be able to see here is reactive shields damage reduction. Damage reduction doesn't reflect very effectively in um, the... Uh, log files um, the riot rail shot from the pulsar droids um, defense chance my base defense chance is 23 percent there was five of them so this lines up my base defense chance probably worked here but look at my shield chance it went really up there so i was really effective at shielding those attacks um, things that are interesting is gift of the master right uh, four attacks didn't care about my defense chance. It has a really high accuracy. Um, it's uh, probably an AOE attack of some sort. Um, my shield, 100% shielded it. It's a very low count, so it's not really effective to look at it that specifically, but no defense chance there. Let's look at another one. Uh, the bomber, um, zero defense chance, high accuracy. Um, here is a, a war machine. Two attacks, no defense chance. But Imperial Siege Droid, Pulsar Power Droid, defense chance, I was able to get up there. So understand that certain attacks, you can come back here at the damage taken, look at them, what was effective. A certain number will stand out to you. Okay, that worked, that didn't work. Um, so it's a really handy tool to be able to go and do this. The other thing that we can do is we can look at certain segments of the fight. So I can just click on that if I wanted to look at just those last part of the fight and parse that out. Or if I tried something at a specific point in the fight, um, I can go to the combat logs and I can do I can do riot gas and I can see, okay, I activated riot gas at 502. And again, at, you know, down here. So let's look at 730 and it dropped off at 7.30.
So I activated it on Warlord Kephas. He was in there from 7.30. So we can go to... And what's handy about this is now if we go to damage taken, we can look at stuff under that effect. So we can see what the defense chance went at. Right? We can look at did riot gas make a difference? We can compare that to before and after effects. So this is a really, really handy little tool to be able to understand what effect certain abilities have for the fight. A great place to practice is um, Hammer Station Master Mode. I'm year in with my companion HK. 55 and he's at level 50 my selection here is i went with the disruptor rifle because i want a little bit more dps here uh, my survivability is going to be okay I'm going to turn my companion off here for a bit. I don't want to get aggroed. I'm just gonna... So I'm going to use my defensives here to survive for a little bit. Turn my companion back on. We put a reflector. Get some additional... A lot of defensive still that I can trigger. I'm gonna... Okay. Turn my companion off again. And my companion off to start with. So at this boss, you can see the abilities being fed in from the top. As I'm activating it, bottom right, you see my stats panel. At eight minutes, the boss will enrage. We're going to experiment here with a little bit of all of the kinds of things we were talking about. Pushing, pulling. So here we go going with a three, two, one. Yeah, there's my cooldown on my taunt. Take note, I only got one uh, three second cooldown on my taunt. I wasted the one on the next, but my threat is over 39,000. There's that cooldown kicking in. So my threat right now is up at 44,000. Wait for the so I can get that another cooldown. So now I'm up at 50,000. I'm safely situated at the uh, tanking this boss. And we can do another rotation of double stacking our taunts. Okay, so I'm now really up there at 90,000. I don't have to worry about it. So if you've taken notice, I'm taking uh, this beam attack. I'm building up stacks from the beam attack, if you can see here. 
but my companion is cleansing me so generally you want to be cleansed around five stacks um, i don't need to generate worry too much about threat once in a while i can taunt and um, keep my threat up there we can do one more rotation here of taunting Up at 144,000. We can take a long time to lose our threat to DPS levels. So let's play around a little bit here. Um, let's look at push and pulling. If you take note, if I go further enough from a range of damage, I can pull them. I can also line of sight them. See how once they're done with the beam attack, see how they move. So we can do that. Let's wait for these guys to get. Let's look at um, pushing. So he can't do much with the laser while he's activating the laser. That's common with range attack bosses that once they can only move in between actions. So I'm gonna pull him back here. Now let's look at pushing. See that little circle underneath him? So I can't move him while he's laser. So, we can finish with that. Now I can push in. Look around that circle. How oh, I'm pushing him out of that. His personal bubble. He can't do it while he's activating a ability. Now what we can notice is how big his hitbox is. See he can't move further back. He's back up against the wall. So now let's look about steering him a little bit. Yeah, I can move him this way. got a pretty big space that he occupies but I can't push him further. Now what's the advantage of doing this? It means I can put him up in here and if I can line of sight some attacks and this might not be possible with all bosses but some bosses you can break an attack by lining of sighting it. He's not that way he shoots through obstacles but other bosses are not always the same. So my main concern here right now is that eight minutes he's going to enrage and I need to use my defensives to stay alive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get him into a spot by pulling him and then I'm going to start doing some damage as much as I can. I want to save my defenses for that eight minutes because that's really where it's going to be a problem.
there is a rage now. So I'm gonna wait until I really need it. For my first offensive. And the first one is gonna be Culture Infusion. And I'm gonna make sure that my companion can't keep up. there my companion was slow at cleansing me and he saw how much those stacks really but my culto infusion really clear got me up there okay, next is gonna get Alter infusion. Next is going to be my reactive shield. Let's activate that. And you can see how that really protected me. The damage reduction is really impressive. Good time to use the regular attacks using the accuracy reduction. And I have that infused cult attacks back. Activate it just to make sure we, in case the stacks go high. I'm gonna have it. Let's get it back with battle focus. And so it's a great time to actually get into that um, time where you have to deal with the enrage. Let's have a look at a little bit at Star Posh. What I'm going to do is um, go to Damage Taken, Ability. I want to see the attacks and let's zoom in. And what you can take note here is that the demolition droids there's nothing you can do when you... I just got one hit. They have... It's an AoE, so defense chance is not going to do anything. Never shielded that attack. Uh, the targeted laser beam, defense chance doesn't do anything. But look at the shield. Um, so anything that improves your shield chance, that's a really great time to reduce the amount of damage you're taking from um, that. Um, range attacks. His range attacks definitely is affected by defense chance. But also keep in mind that I didn't use defensives at the whole start of the fight. Uh, so let's look towards after eight minutes what that looks like. So I can drag the slider up to eight minutes. And now we're looking at this last poor part of the fight. So now we look at the range attack and look at the defense chance went up. I was using more of that. 
Uh, the targeted laser, definitely there's some of them that can be used against defense chance. So if you can, there's some accuracy value that you can reach with defense chance. So if you had a high enough defense chance, if it looks like you can uh, affect that. So this is what I was talking about, different attacks having different accuracy values. And if you can attain that right amount of defense chance, you can do that. But look, it's much better to invest into your shield when you use the targeted laser attack. So uh, shield damage reduction is great. Um, and then the range attack didn't care much about the shield, but it really cared about defense chance. So this is where you can know where certain uh, defensives really play a huge role in uh, dealing with this. So... The other thing that we can look at since we're looking at the last eight minutes we can look at the damage if i zoom out here we can look at the stats at the top left and we can see that i was in the first part of the fight where i wasn't using the fences let's look up to about eight minutes my damage taken per second was nine thousand heals about thirteen thousand if we look at the last part of the fight It went up to 19,600 damage taken per second. Um, heals that the droid had to, heals uh, at that point was at now 19,200. So really um, massive difference, double the amount of damage, even with me rotating in my defensives. So then Rage really does pump up that amount of damage. So we can really play around with star parts to really understand the fight where we need to change things where we need to adjust me uh, mechanisms so just on a final note with the one tanking class that does not have a personal cleanse if you do need to have a cleanse uh bring a healer along uh that will be really handy for you uh or use one of your defensives that you uh, have that might be suitable for the situation hopefully this guide was helpful and hope you have fun with the game